All right, now 1 uh, Kings 13, that's a, probably one of the better known stories in the Old Testament. Of course, this is taking place right after the death of Solomon and then Jeroboam you know, uh, takes over the, the northern kingdom when, it, when it's divided. And uh, he's the first king of, the, of, the, of that divided kingdom of the northern kingdom of Israel. And we see here that one of the first things that Jeroboam does is he sets up this altar in chapter 12 where he's trying to uh, convince the people of Israel that these are their gods. Now he sets up these, this altar and the golden calves because he's afraid, if we were to read chapter 12, he's afraid that the people are going to um, grow, uh, they're going to start to long to go back to Israel, or back to Judah, it would be rather at that time, and to start to worship in the house of the Lord. So instead he decides that he's going to set up his false religion and that he's going to make sure that everybody kind of stays in his kingdom because he's afraid to lose the power that he's, that he's come into. <coughs> and it's an interesting chapter. There's a lot there. I mean, a, a guy could get up and preach so many different messages out of this one chapter. I think there's a lot we could learn from it. <coughs> but one thing I want us to take note of, first of all, is that in verse 1 it says that this guy, he's not given a name if you notice. He just says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah. And we never learn this man of God's name. We never learn what his name was. And it's kind of interesting because in, a, in the Bible, a lot of times, the, the prophets that preached a hard message or, or did what was right by the Word of God, their names are mentioned. I mean, we can take, talk about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and so on and so forth. All these great prophets that, that go out and, and preach a bold and hard message, and their names are mentioned. They're, it's kind of like a, an honor that's given unto them. They're, their names are just immortalized in Scripture. But this guy, it's not so. And, I, and I've heard, and I don't think this is a, a wrong interpretation, that see, some people say, well, it's because of his disobedience. Hmm. You know, he was held back from that. He was a, God kind of took that reward from him and just said, you know what, because of the fact that you didn't, he didn't obey, that he's kind of a, an example of, of uh, you know, compromising there at the end or, or allowing himself to be deceived, that that was taken from him. And I think that's a, that could be, very well be the interpretation. But I also think there's another interpretation. And you could say that they're both right. And the way I want to come at it is here is to show us that I, th I think the reason why this man of God isn't mentioned specifically by name is because of the fact that, that names are unimportant. You know, mm -hmm. it, it goes to show us that it's not the name of the man that matters. I mean, he has that title, the man of God, but it, is, is his name really important? And uh, if, you go, if you were to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where we'll see why names aren't important. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And then look there in verse 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 11, the Bible reads, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now what's the contention? Now this I say that every one of, of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So Paul here is laying down. He's saying, "Look, you guys need to quit getting so hung up on names. Yeah. You shouldn't worry so much about you know whether you whether you're a Paul, or whether you're of of of, of uh, Apollos or Cephas. And if you would turn over just over to First Corinthians three. In fact, he kind of he kind of puts the smack down a little bit for for having this attitude of thinking that you know it's the the person's name that we need to get behind. First yeah. Corinthians chapter three, verse four, and he says. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not, are ye not carnal? So he's saying, you're carnal. If you're going to get hung up in thinking that it's a name that's important, that being associated with a, a person's name and lifting that name up, he's saying that's a carnal thing to do. Right. And he says, who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe? That's the important thing about Paul and Apollos. It's not that, that they had a name, that they were these these great lofty men, but that, rather that because they were ministers, they were servants, that were willing to go out and, and help others to believe on the Lord. As it says there, they were ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. And he says, I have planted, Paulus watered, but God gave the increase. And I was thinking about this yesterday, this verse, as we were out soul winning, because I ran into a guy, I was knocking on the door, and um, he kind of got me flustered. I'll have to admit, I was kind of, I kind of came up against the wall, I was about ready to just, you know, threw my hands up and say, you know, this guy just wants to argue and walk away. And he came at me with this real strange kind of just out of left field argument. I said, uh, 
I was just starting to get into the gospel, and I showed him. I said, you know, the Bible says that we deserve hell. You know, I took him Revelation 21, 20 and 21, 8 and showed them all the, the list of sins and how we're all liars, and because of that, you know, the wages of sin is death. And we, I use that word deserve. And something about that word deserve just hung up on him. Like, he got hung up. Well, I don't like that word deserve. You shouldn't say that. I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, I, you know, you don't really deserve hell. And so, well, you earned it. So, of course, you deserve it. He right. wanted to kind of argue about this. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. So, you know, you say one thing, I say another, it's all the same. He, and he kind of wanted to make a point of contention. But eventually, I ended up getting through the gospel with him. But the whole time, I have to admit that I'm going through it, and I was just kind of, the whole thing had thrown me off, and, I, and, and uh, I wasn't really ready to come back and recover. But the point is, is at the end of it, I, I had said, you know, I, I asked him if he believed all this stuff, and he got hung up, and, and he didn't want to pray. And I, were, I was, kind of shook his hand and said goodbye, but then my partner that was with me, you know, he piped up and said, hey, can I show you one more verse? And praise the Lord, he was able to take him and, he, and, and show him from the scripture what where he was hung up at and the man ended up getting saved wow and i remember walking away feeling pretty inadequate thinking man why can't i do that why i should have been able to take the word of god and do what he did you know and it's just one of those things that sometimes that happens i and i told my partner i said man thanks i was kind of drowning there appreciate you were there but i thought about this verse that it's not it's not about me the fact that i didn't get to lead someone to the word he did it's not about the name. It's not about the person that's that got right. to do it. It's about the fact that somebody got saved. Yeah. It's about the name. It's not about the name. It's about that message. And that's the, that's the title of the message this morning. It's the message that matters. It's the message that matters. It's not what. It's not who's saying it. It's what's being said. Amen. That matters. Now, if you turn back to First Corinthians or First uh, Kings chapter thirteen, we'll be there all morning. So I should have told you that first of all. But just keep something bookmarked there. <clears throat> and look at verse two. So what is it? You know, we see, first of all, it's just a man of God. He's not given a name because I think the Bible is trying to show us that it's, his name is unimportant. It's his message. So let's look at his message and let's look at how he preached it because, again, it's the message that matter, matters. And not necessarily what's being said, but also, I believe, the nature of which it is said, how it's being said. Verse 2, it says, And he cried against the altar. I think that's really important. That that's what we need today. We need some people that are going to cry. We need people who are going to lift up their voice. And it's not that he got there and was like, when it says cried in the Bible, it doesn't mean like we would think of it today where he literally right. cried. He was like, oh, you know, <laughs> weeping and feeling sad. Yeah. And if you would turn over to Isaiah chapter 58, keep something in 1 Kings 13, but Isaiah chapter 58, we'll start to look at some examples. And a lot of people, this is important because today we have a lot of people, they, they, don't, like, they don't like loud preaching. They get offended by people who lift up their voice. Right. There's a lot of people today, they, just, they, they, say, they say things like, well, I don't want anybody, to, I don't want to go to church to get yelled at. Well, you wouldn't have liked any of the, old prof, the prophets in the Old Testament. Yeah, there you you go. know, we're going to look at a couple of them here in Isaiah chapter 58. You know, me personally, I like loud preaching. I like preachers that will lift up their voice. Amen. It says here in Isaiah chapter 58, verse, uh, verse 1, God saying to Isaiah, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, yeah. and show my people their transgressions, and the house of Jacob their sins. You see, we need a loud message today. That's what, that's what God is, is showing Isaiah here in Isaiah chapter 58. He's saying, lift, he's saying, cry aloud. You know, don't be quiet. He's saying, lift up thy voice, and he likens it unto a trumpet. Now, anybody that's had any kind of a background in, uh, in you know, in band, maybe in junior high or high school or anything like that, or has been around any kind of a, a brass section or a woodwind section, they would know that trumpets, though they're a smaller instrument, they're very loud. I mean, they're, they're much louder than a larger instrument. A larger instrument. You know, we that, that's what we need. We need a loud instrument for our voice today. When we're preaching the word of God, you know, we need to preach loudly. We need to preach clearly. And we need to not have like a, like you would think, well, let's compare it to, a, it's interesting that he uses a trumpet. I mean, we compare it to another instrument. Like there's a lot of preachers out there, you would think they're, that this said, lift up thy voice like a clarinet. You know, like a soft, <laughs> like an oboe. You know, just right. soft, soothing. You know, the, the, the trumpet's a very brassy, it's a very loud, it's, it's very distinct. Yeah. And you know, these other instruments, you know, you can kind of, sometimes you hear them, you're not quite sure, is that, the, is that the clarinet, is that the oboe, is that the French horn? What is that I'm listening to? Right. But a brass is a very, the, the trumpet has a very distinct, loud uh, sound. And that's what we need. And that's, that's what God expects of his prophets. He wants them to lift up their voice like a trumpet. And that's the example of the prophets that we see. I mean, if you read Isaiah, if you read Jeremiah, if you read all these other prophets, that's what they're doing. They go into a city and they cry aloud. They lift up their voice. And they cry aloud. So that's the nature of the message. 
It's the message that matters. The way it needs to be preached is it needs to be preached loud and clear. If you would turn over to uh, Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20, look at uh, verse 7. We'll see another example of an Old Testament prophet who did as he was instructed and lifted up his voice like a trumpet. Isaiah chapter 20, beginning in verse 7. O Lord, Thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil, because of the Lord was made unto me, made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. So we see here that in, in Jeremiah, he said that's how he preached. He cried out against the violence. He cried out against the spoil. Because of the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto him. That's, that's another example. So if people today have a problem with a preacher that gets up and lifts up his voice or speaks loudly or speaks clearly, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go for Jeremiah. They right. wouldn't like Isaiah. And not only that, they wouldn't like John the Baptist. If you would, turn over to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, while I read to you from John chapter 1. John chapter 1, the Bible reads, this is John the Baptist. John bare witness of him. So he's bearing witness of Christ. We know that. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh before me is preferred before me. So the man, the precursor to Jesus Christ, the man that was ordained of God to go and to speak the word of God to the people and to make straight the paths for, for Jesus Christ, to prepare the way for him, he was to do it in a specific way. And, he, and the way he did it was that he cried aloud. He spared Amen. not. He didn't go there and, and speak a nice, soft-spoken message. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that every guy that gets up in a pulpit has to, has to get up and growl like a, a grizzly bear. <laughs> you know, I mean, that would be great. But everybody's different. And, I, and I, I enjoy a preacher who will lift up his voice as much as, you know, is in him. You know, if it's obvious that the way he's preaching is that that's him fired up. When he gets fired up, when he cries aloud, that's the way he sounds. You can tell when a guy is like that. And that's the kind of preaching... That, that we're instructed to have out of the Word of God. That's the like, type of preaching that I like to listen to. And I think a lot of God's people, they like a nice, loud, clear message. That's right. In John chapter 7, we'll see. So we've seen that you know, to cry aloud, that's the example of Isaiah. That's the example of Jeremiah. That's the example of many of the Old Testament prophets. That's the example of John the Baptist. But it's also the example of Jesus Christ himself. John chapter 7, look at verse 25. John 7, 25, the Bible says, Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know, we know whence this man, what, we know this man whence he is. But when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple, now again, this doesn't mean Jesus, you know, got the Kleenex out and was <laughs> crying in the corner. Right. You're thinking of weeping, you're thinking of wept. And Jesus did weep and he wept in places. But here it's saying that he cried, when he says he cried, it means he lifted up his voice like a trumpet. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. So there he is crying and lifting up his voice and preaching a hard message. That's the example we see of Jesus Christ over in John chapter 12. You can turn there if you like, or I can just read it to you. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. So Jesus has this message for them, and he wants to make sure that they hear it. So he doesn't just, you know, send them, you know, a newsletter. He doesn't get them on their, his emailing list to make sure and preach this hard message. No, he lifted up his voice at that exact moment, and he cried aloud so that they could hear it. Right. And that's what we need today. That's the type of preaching, if you would turn back to uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. That's the type of preaching. It's the message that matters. Well, okay, if it's the message that matters and not the man, what's the nature of that message? How should it even be preached? One, we need to see we see that it needs to be preached aloud. It's something that needs to be cried aloud. Look at verse 2 again where it says, And he cried against the altar of the Lord. Not only do we need a man of God to cry aloud and lift up his voice, 
But he needs to be specific about what he's crying against. He needs to cry against something. And that's what we really are lacking today. I mean, there's a lot of preachers today. They do fine getting up and raising their voice. But it's a bunch of hot air. They're not really preaching against anything. Come on. And there's so many things today that we need. We need confrontational preaching today. That's we need right. preaching that's going to that's gonna call, you know, call a spade a spade. It's going to call sin out. And it's going to preach against some things. Amen. You know, the man of God here, he didn't just show up and cry aloud. For, against anything. He just didn't start you know, reciting you know, the alphabet or something. He had something specific that he wanted to cry against. He cried against the altar. We need preachers today that are going to stand against some things. Like this man of God. He preached against something. I mean, we could, we could think here, we could make a whole list, just pages of notes of things that, that men of God today need to preach against, and they're not. You know, we could think of things like, like uh, drunkenness, right? That's a big sin today in America. We got a bunch of drunks in this country. That's everyone's right. given to wine. Everyone's drinking all the time. And the Bible's very, very specific. It condemns drinking in the Bible. It yes, condemns it drunkenness in the Bible. But there's so many preachers today that don't, they wouldn't touch that subject with a ten foot pole because they're just afraid of it. They don't want to offend somebody. That's not the nature of this man here. That's not what matters. It's not whether or not you're going to offend somebody. It's the message that matters. They need to preach about drunkenness or fornication. I mean, you go into these fun centers, you go into these these new church, these uh, non-denom churches. They're full of fornication. Yeah, they are. I know when I first got saved, I was kind of in and out of these things, and and they were, and I saw people drinking wine. I saw people that were, you know, fornicating, and it's all just tolerated in these churches today. And you think any of those guys, and those, any of those pastors in those churches, are ever going to stand up and cry aloud and lift up their voice against fornication? No, no way, not going to happen. I'd be shocked if it ever happened. But that's what we need today. And then you, then you wonder why our nation is in the con in condition it's in. Because there's no men of God that are willing to cry against something. There might be some guys that are, get up there and get fired up and, and start you know, crying aloud about you know, the pre-trib rapture or why the Jews are the cho God's chosen people, right. all these false doctrines. They'll get up and they'll cry aloud. They'll get all fired up about something. But it's very rare that we're finding any men of God today who'll get up and cry aloud against, against, against some things that need to be cried aloud against. Amen. Drunkenness, fornication. Adultery, divorce, all these big sins that the Bible goes on and on about, whole chapters that are dedicated to these sins, never get preached about, never get cried against by a man of God. Now, I'll say this if he won't preach at those people that are without, if you got a guy, uh, a man of God, who'll get up behind a pulpit and he's, not, he's afraid to even preach against the people that are without the church, you know, he's afraid to you know, preach against the sodomites. Which, by the way, that's where they belong. Right. Outside the church, not yeah. inside the church. There you go. If you got guys say that won't even get up and preach against those that are outside the church, do you think he's ever going to get on your sin? Do you think he's ever going to help you by preaching against the things in your life? It's never going to happen. If he's too afraid to preach against those that are without, he's never going to preach against those that are within the church. Now, one thing they could preach, we talked about these sins that they could preach against, right? The drunkenness, the fornication. But what did this guy in 1 Kings, Kings 13 preach against? He preached against the altar. You know, he preached against some false doctrine that was being set up. He preached against the, the false religion. And boy, that would be another one some of these guys could stand to get up and rip on, couldn't it? That they could lift up their voice and preach against all the false doctrine that's being preached in these churches. I believe that there's some guys out there that are sitting and are standing up behind pulpits week in and week out. They know what their Baptist brethren believe is completely wrong. They know the Bible, they've been reading their Bible, they've been listening to other sound preaching, and they know that the, that the people they're associated with are dead wrong about what they preach and what they, and what they believe when it comes to end times prophecy or, or, or the nation of Israel. All, you name the subject, there's so many out there, but they're too afraid to get up and preach against it, and they need to. Yeah, they do. And they're afraid to preach against it because of those that are without. You know, the, the, black, the backlash that they'll get from their, their Bible college. You know, big deal. So what? You know, you want, that's another subject you guys need to preach against. Bible colleges, right? Yeah. But they're afraid to preach against these things because they don't want the backlash. But you know what? That means they're just not going to ever preach against the people that are in the, in the pew. And we need that. We need that hard preaching to keep us right and to help us grow. And they need to preach against the false doctrine, like repent of your sin salvation. Amen. I mean, that's, a, that's a battle that's been raging for a long time now. And it's not going anywhere because it's still going to be heavily promoted by all these false prophets that are out there. And we need some guys that will get up and preach against this altar of false doctrine. You know, this lose your, sal your, you lose your sal uh, salvation. You know, preacher will say, you know, you could lose your salvation. It's not once saved, always saved. Well, yes, it is. The Bible is clear about yeah. that. And we need some men to get up and preach against this false doctrine. Amen. 
but they don't want to do that. They want to get they want to get all excited about you know how how Israel is is uh, you know God's chosen people. That's that's what they get fired up about. So it's not just enough to get fired up and cry aloud. It needs to be against something. It needs to be against something that God is against. God is against some things. You know, we could turn to some passages and, and see some things that God hates. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll see here next that it's the message that matters. And because it's the message that matters, we need, we need to understand that, that um, when people are offended, that's okay. People are going to be offended. Yeah. And we should not allow that to, to help cause us to hold back, offending people. The offended, you know, they can't refute the message because it's the message that matters. If the message is, is, is sound, if the message is biblical, they can't refute it. And that's what we see so often. They can't refute it. Instead, they just attack the messenger. You know, and if you have a hard time believing this, just go on Pastor Anderson's YouTube channel and read the comments. You know, I'm thinking specifically about this whole video that Pastor Anderson put out against Greg Locke, this pastor that just got divorced recently. Right. That, you know, and they say, well, you don't know the details. I don't need to know the details. The fact is, he's a pastor, claims to be a pastor, and he's divorcing his wife. Now, the scripture is clear, you know, you have to be the husband of one wife. And if man know not how, how, uh, how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? If you can't take care of that most important fundamental, re fundamental relationship in your life as a man, your wife, you have no business trying to lead other people. Amen. Being an example to other people. That's just the facts. It is. That's the fact that matters. I don't need to know the details of what happened between this man and his wife. The fact is, is he's getting divorced, which the Bible condemns. And, it, you know, and Pastor Anderson puts out a video like that and just calling this guy out, which ought to be done because there's so many people that he's just leading down this, this, this you know, this, this primrose path down to destruction because people are going to follow his example. And a man, a man of God gets out and cries aloud like he ought to, and he cries against this sin that this man's guilty of, and you go and you read these comments, and these people are just like, they can't refute the message. They can't take you to a passage in Scripture and say, well, actually, here's where you're wrong. You know, if I'm wrong, you go ahead and correct me. I mean, you name the doctrine, by the way. I mean, if, we're, if our doctrines that we believe, like the post-trib, pre-wrath rapture, like that, that, that Israel is not God's chosen people, if, these, if we're so dead wrong on these, on these, on these uh, doctrines, it should be very easy for a man of God to get up and just take the Bible and just clearly explain it and clearly debunk us, but they can't. And they don't. And you go and you read these, these comments, and all you see them is just attacking the man. Just attacking the man. You see that in First, in First Kings chapter 13. Look at verse 2 again. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born un, unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burnt incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Jump down to verse 4. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam Heard the saying of the man of God. So he's hearing the hard message, right? Watch how he reacts. Which I cried against the altar of Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, and saying, lay hold on him. He wanted to shut this guy up, probably maybe, who knows, do what to him, once they got a hold of him. Put him in prison, kill him, anything. He, but he couldn't refute the message. He didn't want to get up and say, well, here's where you're wrong, man of God from Judah. Let me, let me straighten you out. This is why what I'm doing is right. Let me, let me show you how what I'm doing is correct. No, he just attacks the messenger. So when we offend people, that's okay because it's the message that's offending them. And this is a great and this guy from this man of God from Judah. I mean, you know, we, we read on later where he makes his mistakes, but when you consider the way he started out, man, he, I think he's a great example. I and mean, he's somebody who, who who understood that preaching is just not an or a, fear is not an option for a preacher. That if you're going to be a preacher, you know, you just you can't be afraid. You cannot be afraid of their faces. You cannot be afraid of, of the message that you have to preach. Yeah. The Bible says that, uh, that, that, that fear is just not an option. And we think that, turn over to Matthew chapter 10 real quick, and we'll see a great example of this. Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus calls his 12 disciples and then sends, sends them forth two by two to the lost, house of, uh, lost tribes of the, of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter 10, look at verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now that sounds scary, right? You're being sent out as a sheep. Now a sheep is not a fearsome creature. I mean, the sheep has really no way of defending itself. There's no fangs, there's no claws. You know, kid, little kids don't have nightmares about sheep. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We, we count sheep to go to sleep, right? So he's sending them out as this harmless, helpless creature in the midst of wolves. 
I mean, when I talk about a devourer, somebody who can destroy, that's a wolf, right? Yeah. That's the situation that Jesus is describing here. He's sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against the Gentiles. But when they deliver you, take no thought what ye shall, or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which is in you. And he talks about how the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and you'll be hated for all men's sake, and then they will persecute you in this city. And then he tells them, you know, that's the way it's got to be. Verse 24, the disciple is not above his master. It is enough for his master to be as a disciple. And in verse 26, he says this, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be, re which shall, which, that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach on the housetop. And fear not them which shall kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul, soul and body in hell. He's saying, you know what, I'm going to give you a hard message. You're going to have to go out there and you're going to be hated. There's people that are going to not like the things that you have to say, but what do you tell them? Don't be afraid. You can't be afraid. Fear is not an option for the preacher. Fear is not an option for the soul winner. Fear is not an option for us when we go out to preach the gospel. That's good. I mean, it's our natural inclination. We might get nervous. I know for a long time, and, and so, even now often, you know, that first door I go to knock, we got the butterflies a little bit. I don't know how this is going to be received. But you know what? After that first person comes, it's just like, no matter, no matter the outcome of that first door, it's just like, what was I so worried about? This is, you know, it's not, it's not. The worst thing they can say is, you know, I had some person the other day, we were talking about receptive, I think I had one person that was kind of a jerk. Knocking on their door, and I could hear him. It was one of those security screen doors. I hate Phoenix for that because you can yeah. never. They come to the door and you can't see him. Right. <laughs> so they come to the door and they're not even at the door. They can hear him walking back and forth. And I knock on the door. Go away, dude. Not interested. Oh man, you told me to go away. <laughs> you know, was that what we're afraid of? Just being told to go away. Right. You know, and I'm sure there's other places we could go to where it's much more. You know, if you go to some of these more liberal places, well, they'll, they'll, oh, you want to come to my door with the Bible? Let me give you a piece of my mind. And we've all probably had experiences like that if we've gone out soul winning. But that should never be a reason for us to be afraid that somebody's going to say something mean to us or be nasty to us. You know, and that's one thing that I think people struggle with the most when it comes to soul winning is they have a hard time. I know for myself, and I've seen others do it, it's, it's something, it's a discipline that you have to put into practice that when you have a bad door, when you get a bad reception, you need to learn to just leave it there. You need to just be able to walk away and, and, and shake the dust off your feet and keep a good attitude and move on to the next one. It seems like so often we get that bad door and we want to keep talking about it through the next three or four doors. Yeah. And that will begin to affect our spirit, affect our attitude, and we'll become discouraged. Right. When you have a bad door, just leave that bad door there and move on to the next one. That's always always good, I think, to have a, a different conversation going on with your partner. Yeah. When, you're, when you're out soul winning. Be talking about something that's completely unrelated you know, so that that doesn't become the focus of, of the conversation. But the point I'm trying to make here is that Jesus is showing us in Matthew 10 that fear is not an option if you're going to be a soul winner. Fear is not an option if you're going to be a preacher, if you're going to be a man of God like the guy in 1 Kings 13. If you're going to cry aloud, if you're going to make others hear the things that you have to say, and you're going to be cry against something, if you're going to preach the Word of God, you're going to offend people. And if you're afraid of offending people, then you're going to, you're going to trim back the message, you're going to hold back, which is not what we need. We need people that are going to be unafraid, and then they're going to preach. Turn over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll see where, where Paul exhorted Timothy uh, you know, to have this kind of an attitude, to not be afraid. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God. So this isn't like optional. He's not saying, hey, you're going to, Timothy, man of God, you know, my protege, the one who I'm, who I, who I'm leaving to, to ordain elders. You know, I charge thee, you must do this. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And then it has this, period. There's no option there. You didn't give them an out. Unless, of course, Timothy, you know, the mayor walks in, or somebody with a lot of money, you know, Mr. Moneybags walks in, or or you know that if you preach this, you're going you're to lose people. No, he says, preach the word. Instant, in, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all suffering and doctrine. Why? Then he gives them the exact reason why. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust 
shall they keep to themselves teachers having itching ears. He didn't say, hey, Timothy, when that time comes, just try to blend in with those other teachers. You know, just try to blend in with them, and, and maybe we can get our message across to them that way. Maybe we can just be incognito. We can just be, you know, undercover Christian, and, and, and we can sneak in with all the false prophets and kind of, you know, work from the inside out. He's saying, no, you need to preach the word, be instant, don't be afraid, for the time will come. When that time comes, when people don't want to endure sound doctrine of church, where when people get into sin, that's the time to preach against it. That's not the time to hold back. Right. That's the time to lift up your voice and cry aloud and spare not. Preaching the word will offend everyone. Yeah, well, everyone. If you preach the whole counsel of God, I guarantee you, you're going to offend everyone at some point or another. Every single person that hears the sound of your voice, if they stick around long enough, is going to be offended by something you preach. And that's perfectly natural because not one of us is perfect. We've all, we're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. We're all going to have sins in our life. We're all going to have things that we need to work on or get better or, or areas in our life where we're coming up short or things that we need to improve on. And if we stick around a man of God that's going to lift up his voice and cry aloud and spare not, mark it down, one day it's going to, it's going to fall in your lap. It's going to come across to you. The preacher's going to come to you and preach, and preach to you. Now, he might not be going out of his way to preach to you, I mean, that's the great thing, you know, about, about having a, a church with a lot of people in it. You know, the preacher can just start preaching, and whoever, it's going to apply to somebody at somewhere yeah. at some point. But the preaching of the God's Word will offend everyone. The Bible says in James 3, I'll read for you, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, I used to read this and think that he's talking about the fact that God is going to hold them accountable, and maybe they're going to be, you know, condemned by God for some of the things that they did wrong. But I think what it's referring to with the condemnation is the condemnation of others. Mm. He said, if you're going to be, if you're going to be a preacher, if you're going to be a master, if you're going to teach the word of God, you're going to receive greater condemnation than somebody that isn't. Somebody who says, "Yeah, I believe the word of God," and they live by the word of God. They'll probably offend some people along the way. They're going to offend their family members. They're going to offend their friends and the people at work, maybe. But the guy who gets up and he's going to be the master, he's going to be the preacher, he's going to be the teacher. He's going to receive greater condemnation from the world. There's going to be more people that he offends. For in many things, we offend all. We offend all. The guy who gets up and spares not and lifts up his voice, he offends all. You see, those that teach and preach are condemned by those that hear them and are offended. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 13 on this point. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse 17. Bible says, Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. You see, the preacher here, he's not trying to offend you. If, you ever, if you're ever sitting in a church, and the preacher gets up and preaches something that, take, that rubs you the wrong way, you know, you got to understand that he's not trying to offend you. As it says here, he's saying, you know what, obey them. Submit to that preaching. Submit to that instruction those that have the rule. And he's saying, why? Because they watch for your souls. Now, they're not looking for an opportunity to make you mad. Let me see if I can just, you know, ruffle this guy's feathers. Let me see if there's something I can find out about, you know, whoever it is. And let me just get on their point and just and really get after them, right? And right. just be a bully from the pulpit. That's not what happens. Mm -hmm. and a lot of times, preachers get accused of that. Well, that guy's just a jerk in the pulpit. You know, he's just out to get people. Well, no, maybe it's because you've got a sin in your life that he touched on. Yeah. Or maybe he went and, and got on an area of your life that you need to improve. Maybe that's what happened. And is that not what we've been reading here in James and in, and, and in Hebrews here? That, you know, people are going to be offended. But the thing is, it's profitable for you to be offended. It's profitable. You profit from hard preaching. You profit from hard preaching. You know, when a, when a guy gets up and preaches hard, it's for your benefit. It's for everybody. It's for the congregation. He doesn't do it, you know to make a name for himself, because again, it's the message that matters. It's not the man. Amen. It's the message that matters. And that's what's going to profit us, is hard, pre hard preaching. Now I'll say this, soft, pre soft pre preaching, you know, that profits the false prophet. That's, that's the prophet. Right. He makes yeah. profit off of that. He's the one that's going to get the big crowd and the money coming in. The hard preacher, he's not going to make profit, you know, financially speaking. He's there to profit you as a true minister. You know, if the pastor comes one day, if you get find yourself in a church where there's hard preaching going on, and the pastor rips your face off, you know, you gotta just thank God for that. Thank God that you're not in some Luke or right. watered down, lame church that is just abundant. I mean, if you want to go find that church, you know, just go pick one. They're everywhere. 
Thank God that you're in a church where a guy's not afraid to get up and lift up his voice and cry aloud and rip some face. Because, you know, you can always grow a new one. You know, you can always grow a new <laughs> face. Good. And you can rip that one too later. If you That's good. To. You know, a lot of times if, if you go to these guys, you know, the pastor might rip your face, but he might hand it back to you when he's done. Like, oh, you're missing something. You know, here, put this back on. Let me, get, let me help you suture that on. He's not out there to just, you know, make you look hideous or, or hurt your feelings or something like that. But if it happens, praise God if that happens, if we're offended by the preaching of the Word of God. That means, like, now we have an opportunity to get right, to correct something. And we have a preacher who's not afraid to, to, to uh, tell us like it is. I mean, I know I've had that happen. I mean, I know I, I sit under a hard preacher. And, it, you know, has, has Pastor Anderson ever gotten up and, you know, whether he knew it or not, just like, you know, got up in my business and, and, and uh, made me feel like this big? Yeah, more than once. But praise God, if you stick it out, you know, you'll grow from that. You see, the no-name preacher... That preach like he should is better than that big shot liar, isn't he? The no-name preacher that gets up, the, the one that isn't re, you know, revered by the world and, and just known by all men, and just and it's just you know some big shot, these Joel Olsteins, yeah, you know, uh -huh. Rick Warrens, all these right. guys that'll just get up and, and, and tell you what you want to hear. They're no good. It's the guy that doesn't have the name but has the right message because it's the message that matters. The no-name preacher that preaches like he should is better than that big shot liar. Look at 1 Kings 13. Look at verse 11. Now there dwelt, verse 11, now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. Well, what's, what's he doing? You know, he's already there. This guy had to come from Judah to Bethel to cry against the altar. This guy's already in Bethel. Why did God just use this old prophet? Because he's a liar. Because he's just an old washed up liar. He was already there. You see, that's what we got today. We got plenty of old IFB guys that are that are already have a pulpit, that already have a crowd, that already have a congregation, that already have all these things ready, you know, already made ready to their hand, but they don't use it like they should, and right. they just they just preach whatever they want. And God won't use a guy like that. God doesn't want to use a guy who's afraid to tell it like it is, a guy who's going to hold back, who's going to spare the message. Look at verse fourteen. And he comes to him, he says, and he went from the man of God and found him sitting. So the old prophet, right, he gets up and he goes and finds the guy. Verse 14. And he found him sitting under an oak and he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said unto him, I am. You see, these old IFB guys, whether they want to admit it or not, they know a man of God when they see one. They know when they hear some of these younger guys getting up and preaching the whole counsel of the word of God, preaching things that they used to hear when they were coming up in these pulpits, preaching things that they heard their preachers rip face on, they know that that's right. Amen. And it's because they're the ones that are afraid to say it. They're the ones that are old and washed up and had, don't have the backbone anymore to tell it like it is. That they still, But they still recognize a preacher when they see one. They still recognize a man of God, whether they want to admit it or not. And these guys, they know good and well that the doctrines that, that they're shying away from are biblical. That's right. The ones that they're pulling back on, the ones that they're attacking, the ones that they're attacking the messenger over, they know that, they're, that that message is right. They just don't want to admit it because they know that they've gotten soft on it because they're weak when it comes to it. So this guy comes and says, oh, you must be the man of God. Did the guy have a, a name tag on him? You know, man of God? We recognize the guy, right? These old guys, they can still recognize the man of God when they see one. They don't want to be perceived, perceived as legit. You know, they don't want to be perceived as as, um, as they want to be perceived as legitimate, though. Look at verse 18. And he says, He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. He said, I'm just like you. Oh, really? That's funny. Why didn't God use you to cry against the altar? You were already in Bethel. You know, why did this guy have to walk from Judah all the way over to Bethel? Right. You know, preach against this altar. If you're just like me, why didn't you stand up and preach against it? Why has he got to call me all the way? I, does this guy have something better to do with this time? To come out and rip face on somebody? You know, come up and tell Jeroboam how it is. I'm sure he had things he could have done. Maybe he had a family. Maybe he had business to take care of. Maybe he had people back in Judah that he hear, hear the preaching of the word of God. But now this guy's got to go out of his way, you know, because the old prophet, you know, just wants to sit around and, and is old and washed up. Right. And he doesn't want to tell it like it is. He doesn't want to lift up his voice about against something. He might lift up his voice about how he's, you know, just full of spirit and, and, and praise God he got all the way saved and he never sins anymore and he doesn't even desire sin right. and take his jacket off and wave it around and jump in a baptistry and run up and down the aisles and, and he'll cry a lot about some, some pretty silly stuff 
But he doesn't want to get up and cry against something that needs to be cried against. And as a result, somebody else has got to come up behind him and do the job for him. But they still want to be perceived as legit, as this, oh, I'm the real deal. I'm a prophet also as thou art. No, you're not. You know, these old, the, old, the only old prophet, never the, the man of God. That's interesting, that's how this guy is only referred to, the old prophet. Not an old man of God, not even a prophet of the Lord, just an old prophet. Who knows what he was preaching? Who knows if that guy was even saved? Who knows if that guy was even, you know, a prophet of the Lord? He could have been a prophet of anybody. That's how he's just referred to as the old prophet. But what are they? They're a bunch of, they're liars. That's what a lot of them are. They're just straight up, they're just liars. Look at verse 18 again. He says, I am a prophet as thou art, and an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord. Now, did we read that taking place in the passage anywhere? No. No. But an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee unto thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So these guys are liars. A yeah, lot of these are. people, they want to... And we see that a lot about these guys that are attacking the messengers today. They attack the messenger. They can't deal with the message, so they just go after the messenger. You know, I think in particular one guy, you know, Sam Gipp. I mean, we want to talk oh. about a guy who just attacks the messenger. It's right. Sam Gipp. Just start slandering, just start making up things, just start attacking people that, you know, people that are getting up and preaching the Word of God like it ought to be preached. People who are right biblically, people who are right doctrinally. They can't handle it. They can't get out the Bible and refute it. They can't lay down a solid foundation out of the Scripture and preach something clear and true out of the Word of God. So they just attack the messenger and make up lies and slander. And that guy is notorious for it. They see a real man of God, and they get jealous, and they lie. This guy wants some of the glory. And he's like, well, hey, man, I'm, I'm the prophet here. I'm the prophet in Judah. I, I, or I'm the prophet in Bethel. I've been here a long time. I'm old. I'm the old-timer. You've got to show some respect, son. You know, he wants this guy to, like, you know, have, have give him some credence, right? Right. Because he's jealous. And all he can do is lie to him or lie about him. Look at verses uh, 19 through 24. We'll read those. So he went back with them and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept back, and hast kept not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest thou and hast eaten bread and drunk water in this place of the of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. And it came to pass after he had eaten the bread, and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass, to wit, uh, for the prophet whom he brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him, by the way, and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it, the lion also by the carcass. So what is the purpose of the old prophet here? I mean, he does still fulfill a purpose, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. It's to serve as a warning. Yeah. That's, all he was, that's all he's good for. It's just to serve as a warning. You know, it's unfortunate we see the downfall of this man of God here from Judah, but it's just showing us that even these old guys, these old washed up liars, they can still serve a purpose as a warning. You know, <laughs> that what it, don't let that be the purpose in your life, by the way, you know, to serve as a warning to others. That, that'd right. be kind of bad, right? But what we can learn from it is we don't need to make their mistakes. Don't make the same mistakes that the old prophets made. You see, the man of God made the same mistake as Jeroboam did, didn't he? What was Mr. Jeroboam's mistake? He put the man before the message. He said, you know what, I can't handle the message the man's bringing against this altar, so I'm going to go after the man. You know, in the same way, the man of God did the same thing. He said, oh, this is no prophet. You know, the, the Lord spoke unto him. I know God, you know, spoke to me and told me directly not what to do and what not to do. But here's this old man. Here's this old prophet. You know, he's speaking nice to me. And, you know, I'm under the cedar tree and I'm, I'm tired, I've got a long journey ahead, and he's saying the angel spoke to him, he's putting the man before the message. He's making that same mistake. He's not taking heed to the message that was given him. He's giving place to a man. That's what the mistake that he made. And we would see that in uh, verses 29 through 31, we'll see the mistake that ha what, what the, that results in. That's what we need to take heed to, is that you know, if we make these same mistakes as these old prophets did, we'll end up in the same place. Verse 29, the, pro the Bible says, And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God, and laid it upon the ass, and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid the carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother! And it came to pass, that he buried him, that he spake to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the sepulchre wherein the man of God is buried, and lay my bones upon his bones. You see, if we mistake the same mistakes, 
we're going to end up in that same hole as that old prophet. And if this generation of young preachers that's coming up, and the men of God in this movement, if they make the same mistakes of putting the man before the message, they're going to end up in the same hole as that old prophet. Uh oh. And that's not good. Nobody wants that. That's that's the that's the that's the purpose that we could take from the man of God, the old prophet here, as a warning that we don't want to end up like him, old washed up liar. And how do you do that? By not be willing to preach against something. By not be willing to lift up your voice. So the message is this, you know, let's preach hard. We need some hard preaching. Let's not shy away from hearing it. Let's not shy away from doing it. Let's preach hard. Let's receive that hard preaching and understand that it's the message that matters, not the man. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you again for the Bible. Thank you for the great stories that we can uh, glean these truths from. Father, I thank you for the Bible. And Lord, just uh, pray that you'd bless us as we go our own way this week. Help us, Father, to, to never shy away from hard preaching, Lord, from either receiving it or, or doing it ourselves, Father. That understand that, Lord, we're living in a time where hard preaching is needed more than ever. Uh, Lord, our, our nation is, is, is ungodly, wicked, adulterous, perverse, Lord, and it's, it's going to hell in a handbasket, and the world is following after it. And Father, help to raise up a generation of men that would, that would cry against the things that need to be cried against. And help us to never make the mistake of putting men first, Lord, or, or holding back the message. Lord, we don't want to end up like that old prophet, Lord, just useless to you. A man you can't use, a man that you know, ends his life just you know, seeking vainglory. But Father, that we would, we would avoid those snares, those pitfalls of the, of, the, of the the generations that came before us, that we would take heed to your word, that we would preach the whole counsel of God. Father, be with us as we go. Bring us uh, back again, we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.